Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and Spider-Man No Way Home is now available in higher resolution! And now that I can actually pause and look at this stuff, instead of begging the AMC projectionist to freeze the frame, I know that's you back there, Nicole Kidman! Folks, there is so much more hidden in this movie that we just gotta re-break down this film. Some of this will be stuff that I found on my first breakdown on release weekend, which has grown to be my most Yay! viewed video ever! Thank you all so much! So, to show my gratitude to you and to the talented artists who worked on this film, I have found well over over 100 more details. I think my final tally is close to 200 that I am gonna present to you in this comprehensive near shot-by-shot -shot analysis of everything great about Spider-Man No Way Home. But I am gonna streamline this and make it less about my commentary now that we've all seen the film. And big thanks to Boxu for sponsoring this video. More on their tasty offerings later. Okay, over the studio titles, we actually hear Mysterio's audio from the post credit scene of Spider-Man Far From Home. I managed to send the elemental back to the dimensional rift, but I don't think I'm gonna make it off this bridge alive. In his dying moments, Mysterio maintained the lie of his illusions coming from an interdimensional rift, all to doom Peter Parker, but also, ironically, actual threats coming from dimensional rifts become the actual crisis in this movie's final battle. The Marvel Studios title card has been updated so that on the R, Replacing Rocket is Peter's portal arrival in Endgame now. Just a little tease for the way this movie will bring back other Peters through the same kinds of portals. Far From Home, of course, ended with the credits cutting off Peter's F-bomb. What the f Here, a car horn censors it. What the f The scene has been recreated almost exactly down to the three extras behind MJ dressed just like the guys behind her in the 2019 scene. They even gave the dude with the phone wired earbuds just like he had before. Attention to detail. But the main difference, of course, is that MJ now wears the broken black Dahlia necklace that Peter bought for her in Venice and gave to her in London, to which she said, I'm sorry it's broken. I actually like it better broken. MJ knows things can never be perfect. Her mantra is, Expect disappointment and you will never get disappointed. And that is why she refuses to let Peter say I love you in order to leave things broken and give him a reason to find her. One onlooker asks, Is it just a kid? A nod to that onlooker on the train in Sam Raimi's Spider Man 2 in 2004 when Tobey Maguire was unmasked. He's just a kid. That Peter's exposure was met with gratitude, leaving him with faith in humanity, but this Peter's exposure is met with hostility, leaving him more cynical. As they swing through the city, they pass billboards for Rogers the Musical, which we saw in Hawkeye, and will return in Secret Invasion. There are also billboards for Fortnite, and the Hyundai Ionic 5, which did a cross-promotional campaign with the film, its slogan, Electrify Your Journey, of course, tying in with Electro. There's also a PlayStation billboard, because Sony. These screens show Peter's face with his mask covering half of it, a recurring image that we've seen in the comics. They land on Queensboro Bridge with the nearby Roosevelt Island Tramway, the same location as the final showdown in the 2002 film. They drop past Flash on his phone as a TikTok feed of the Daily Bugle official, the account hosted by Betty Brant leading up to the film's release. They pop out in front of Del Mar's Deli, now labeled Del Mar's 3, as this is the third film in this trilogy, and we have seen this bodega destroyed at least once. The sign reads, Best Sandwiches in Queens, calling back Mr. Del Mar's line in Homecoming. Best Sandwiches in Queens. And they are coming out of the sewer, actually, because in Queens, the subway turns into an elevated train, as we see in the background. John Watts leaves the camera on a close-up of the manhole cover, and since throughout these opening minutes, we're getting a ton of shout-outs to the past eras, this has gotta be a callback to the closing shot of The Amazing Spider-Man 2. They land outside Peter's bedroom. <laughs> Oh my god, to help her in, Peter accidentally grabs her butt and then immediately says, I'm sorry! Aunt May and Happy walk in on Peter and MJ, a call back to May walking in on Peter shirtless with Ned in Homecoming. MJ hands Peter his I Survived My Trip to NYC shirt that he wore in Homecoming. Also in this apartment is a poster for the Feast fundraiser where Spider-Man made his appearance in Far From Home. John Watts directed the sequence in one two minute long take to heighten the comedic awkwardness in which Tom Holland and Zendaya impressively scramble around this place. When Peter thwips the first shade shut, the animators made sure to show that webbing shooting out of his arm in his reflection in the cabinet, and when the last shade shoots back up, it looks like Tom might actually improvise webbing it shut in order to keep it down. J. Jonah Jameson's graphic shows protester signs calling for Peter to be locked up, another calling him a criminal with devil horns. This awkward photo of Peter is actually his passport photo that we saw in the Far From Home deleted scene. And then over on the far right is a sign reading, it was better when you were blipped. And J. Jonah's home studio is a wall with the trio of terror front page, as well as an Us Weekly that compares MJ 
MJ to Liz Allen using the photo of her from the academic decathlon at DC in Homecoming. Another headline reports Mysterio douses Hydro Man in Venice because in Far From Home, they initially thought the elemental in Venice was the longtime Spidey villain Hydro Man, Morris Bench. Jameson also has some spare bottles of his supplements throughout the place, showing how his whole new fancy studio, the whole business was really paid for by those pills. The Daily News front page has photoshopped Peter, MJ, and Ned using their yearbook photos. And for the first time, we see MJ's last name, Watson, making Michelle Jones Watson a variant of Mary Jane Watson of this universe. Time Magazine calls Peter Iron Man Jr. How did a reckless teenager become Tony Stark's heir apparent? All this echoing the same sentiments of Teen Mysterio from Far From Home, as if this could have been a headline that they scripted for the media. Peter gets coated in green paint. This is actually from a deleted scene with Tom Holland's brother, Harry Holland. And you'll notice the graffiti behind Peter reads Ramos for Umberto Ramos, a longtime Spider-Man comic artist who partnered with Dan Slott. International News is a ticker reporting, Interpol issues arrest warrant for Czech Republic's Night Monkey, showing how European police are still unsure if Spider-Man and Night Monkey from Far From Home are the same person. And then political turmoil continues in New Asgard, suggesting that King Valkyrie's rule over that colony is struggling, something we could see more of in Love and Thunder. The B-roll they show of Tower Bridge shows none of the drones in the open air or Spider-Man's heroics, but just the moments when he and Mysterio were obscured in the tower walkway as Peter wrecked those drones, showing more of Team Mysterio's manipulations. Because if they showed Peter fighting those drones, that would hurt the narrative that Team Mysterio wanted out there that it was Peter controlling the drones. DODC Agent Cleary, name seen on his badge, is a nod to Agent Albert Cleary, the DODC comptroller in the comics. Photographs are taken of a photo of Ned and MJ from Homecoming, as well as Peter's Iron Spider charging point. All these cables plugged into one outlet, but you'll notice the armor itself is missing. We see Tony's Edith glasses from Far From Home, that case just left open, showing how Peter must see this every day as a reminder of Tony. And it's on a stack of PS2 games because Sony. Also, this Peter Parker is a scavenger who goes dumpster diving for old consoles and stuff. Now, during the interrogation, Peter wears his the physics are theoretical, but the fun is real shirt that he wore when Tony dropped him off back home in Homecoming. Agent Cleary says, Nick Fury has been off planet for the last year. What? Yes, Nick Fury in Far From Home was actually the Skrull Talos, a storyline that we're probably gonna revisit in Secret Invasion. Now I'm wondering if Cleary, by the fact that he knows this, could also be a Skrull. Cleary's able to get Ned to confess by tricking him into correcting his misstatement. When MJ told you that Peter was Spider-Man... Uh, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, What's up? I, I knew way before MJ did. I, I was Spider-Man's guy in the chair. And a fun detail here, compared to MJ's observation room that you see in the reflection, Ned's room has way more agents watching, as they all know this is a suspect who's gonna squeal. Now the news also uses a photo of Happy Hogan from his look from the Iron Man 3 prologue that was set in 1999 when he dressed like Travolta in Pulp Fiction. And then Matt Murdock enters, to which we will all applaud with a standing O that he deserves. That's great. Thank you. Well, I have some good news here. But I love how the dialogue here is a total meta-commentary on the insanity of this moment. Peter says, what is happening? Because indeed, Charlie Cox, Matt Murdock in the MCU does raise a lot of questions about the canonicity of all the Netflix Marvel series. And Charlie's first words are, that's great, thank you. Because this is simply great. And I'm sure Charlie is pretty grateful for it. Now, John Favreau, if you remember, played Foggy Nelson in the 2003 Ben Affleck Daredevil, which Charlie Cox said he and Favreau tried to reference in a line that got cut. And there was a line, I think it got cut, I don't think it made it in the final thing but there was a line where he was trying to remember something that happened and he and he he, he said yeah I, I can't remember what happened I'm a little foggy about that Behind Peter is another newspaper that we saw on Jameson's wall, Web of Destruction, showing Peter's damage at the Staten Island Ferry and the Washington Monument and Homecoming and Tower Bridge and Far From Home. But Matt Murdock proves he does have his daredevil reflexes but I love how Peter's hand was already ready there to catch that brick because he has spider sense. And on that brick, the person misspelled the word believe as if refusing to write the word lie in front of Mysterio. They move into Happy's condo. Ah! How do we, how do we... Alarm system, yeah, notice how May punches in the right code on her first try, probably because Happy's passcode was something like one, two, three, four. Pretty sad lapse in security that we learn in Far From Home. What's your password? Password. Now, what is your password? Password, the word spelled out password. You're the head of security and your password is password? I, I don't feel good about it either. We see several of Happy's security badges, calling back him telling everyone to wear their badges in Iron Man 3, but he actually might have swiped a bunch on his way out, knowing that his clearance was gonna be revoked so he could have used someone else's badge to steal all that Stark tech. Notice how Peter carries all five of those heavy suitcases, just a cool little detail showing how strong the kid is. Happy, of course, as the dummy robot from the Iron Man films that we saw him bickering with in Homecoming. Good, yes. 
Yeah, no, no, put that down. That's worth more than you or me. But now he clearly just misses Tony. You can also see his boxing mask and gloves on the table, a callback to his boxing days we saw in Iron Man 2. Now, in the credits of this movie, they shout out Downton Abbey, which is a callback to him loving Downton Abbey in Iron Man 3. But folks, you never see it in the movie. In our previous breakdown, we just pointed some random frame on the shelf saying that was Downton Abbey, but it wasn't. So anyone else who has that in their video just clearly watched ours and stole it from us. Anyway, on the bridge is a drawing Morgan made of her and Happy. There's actually another one later in the laundry area. Aww, but now that Stark Industries was shut down, she'll be stealing her crayons from Applebee's like we did. In the background, we hear the news. You know, put the Captain America shield on the Statue of Liberty? Nah, that's so ridiculous. Leave the Statue of Liberty alone. <sighs> yeah, details throughout this movie foreshadow the Statue of Liberty final act and how most people in New York are against putting Cap's shield on that statue. The shield falling is what almost causes MJ to fall to her death, and it's literally on that shield where Peter almost makes his worst decision. So really, the people in New York were right from the get-go. This shield being added to the statue is bad news. Subtle detail that's pretty hard to spot behind that Stark crate. Happy also boosted the Iron Man painting in the style of the Obama Hope poster from Iron Man 2, and on the nighttime security monitor, you can also see that he swiped the recreation of the cap shield that Tony and Coulson had in that movie. When they FaceTime, MJ's reading Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. She always reads celebrated progressive authors. And on her wall is that photo of her and Ned from Homecoming. Also a photo that she took of pigeons in Venice and Far From Home. And the drawings she drew of Peter and Coach Wilson in Homecoming. Oh, I, I know. I just like coming here to sketch people in crisis. <laughs> You. Betty Brant says, Go get him, Tiger! Which, of course, is Mary Jane's catchphrase for Peter in the comics and in the 2004 film. Go get him, Tiger. A supporter screams, MJ! MJ, we love you! MJ, are you gonna have this spider, baby? This is Darnell Appley, an actor and Zendaya's longtime assistant. Also, among that shouting, we hear, Go flip! Ah, yes, Zach Cherry's, Do a flip! Guy returned for a vocal cameo after we saw him in Homecoming. Okay, Spider Man! And after he returned in a cameo on that bus in Shang-Chi. It's your boy Clev coming at you live on the bus. I actually did take a little bit of martial arts as a youth, so I'm gonna try and grade this fight as we're going. Flash Thompson shows off his memoir, Flashpoint. It's titled A Nod to the DC Comics Major Crossover Event. Inside, we see the mural of scientists, how it's been expanded from just Howard Stark in previous films and all the other famous real world scientists to include Abraham Erskine, as well as Hank Pym. And then, if you look closely, standing on George Washington Carver's head, a shrunken ant man with a nearby pin particle vial. Mr. Harrington's display shows a photo of Peter and MJ in Venice that he clearly photoshopped himself into, but also on that yearbook page under Chess Club is a photo of that blip girl, Sue Lorman, mentioned in Far From Home, though it looks like she's given a different name here. Flash's photo is a professional portrait that was taken outside, so fancy. And then all the cards in this display actually list famous Spider-Man comics writers. Peter Unmasked by J.M. Straczynski. That's a nod to J. Michael Straczynski, who wrote the Peter Unmasked issue of the Civil War comics, also wrote the famous One More Day storyline that this is based on, T. DeFalco for Tom DeFalco, K. Busiek for Kurt Busiek, and P. David for Peter David, all of them amazing Spider-Man comics writers. As Peter walks down that hall, on that screen in the upper right is a black and white film. Now I asked people on Twitter if they could identify this. Matthew on Twitter pointed out that this is the same cafeteria from the movie Love, Simon. And although this scene is not from Love, Simon, that movie did shoot in the same Atlanta high school as John Watts shot these Spider-Man movies. So this is actually a side short film that John Watts shot on location here in this school. Because before he directed the Spider-Man movie, he worked with a short film group called Waverly Flams. All those shorts you can still find on YouTube. Now on the roof, graffiti shows Ditko for Spider-Man co-creator Steve Ditko. You can actually see that same Steve Ditko tag on the feast truck throughout the movie. MJ's New York Post reads, Peter Parker and his spider minions, his hypnotic spider senses seduced Joan Watson. Now while Peter does not really have hypnosis powers, this line does foreshadow how in this movie, the memory spell wipes the memory and gaslights MJ. So in a way, that ends up happening. As Peter leans over to kiss MJ, his textbook reads, chemistry, nice. As Peter gets his college rejection letters, Dummy reassembles the Lego Death Star set that Peter and Ned worked on in Homecoming. But then at the end, Dummy breaks it like Ned did in that movie. This parallels the way the actual Death Star was destroyed twice in the first and the third movies of the Star Wars trilogy. As Peter swoops down to MJ's shop, his small silhouette in the sky shows that he was in his Iron Spider suit 
shoot it first, and then the nanobots retracted on its descent. But I guess he was still holding that acceptance letter all the while, so the bots had to like retract around his uh, pinched fingers. I don't know. But when he lands, you can see Mysterio decals on both the lamppost and on the nearby wall, and there is another banner for that Statue of Liberty renovation. As Peter approaches the Sanctum Sanctorum, on the mailbox on the right is a graffiti named Romita for John Romita, another Spider-Man comics writer. And then on the inside, one of the apprentices is played by Emily Fong, longtime Marvel Studios production employee. Wong portals in from upstairs. You can actually see the mechanical Crimson Bands of Sidorak that Strange tossed on Caecilius hanging on the wall there. Wong, I guess, just didn't feel like carrying his luggage downstairs. Makes sense. I would use sling rings for that, too. Now, Strange's mug reads, oh, for fuck's sake. And now that Multiverse of Madness is bringing in Fox X-Men leader Patrick Stewart, Professor X, it truly is for Fox's sake that Strange's world is heating up. He also wears the hoodie of his alma mater, Columbia, probably rubbing it in for Peter for getting rejected from all these elite schools and showing how Strange stays connected with his university and can just talk to them, something that Peter failed to even consider trying. Peter says, It's not about me. I mean, this is really hurting a lot of people. Peter actually unknowingly repeats the Ancient One's core lesson to Strange in the 2016 film. It's not about you. And that is what makes Strange want to help Peter. Wong warns Strange about his memory wipe spell called the Runes of Cough Call. That spell travels the dark borders between known and unknown reality. It's too dangerous. <sighs> We've used it for a lot less. Do you remember the full moon party at Camertage? No. Oh. Exactly. Indicating Strange has used this dangerous reality warping spell before, one of many violations that probably led to the crisis of Multiverse of Madness. Wong then says, Just leave me out of this. Which might be his way of saying, don't include me in the memory wipe spell so that I can remember Peter. And you can see behind Wong is the Camertage courtyard that he's returning to. Now, Peter Parker seeking Doctor Strange's help this way to make everyone forget that he's Spider-Man is a reference to the One More Day storyline, which actually ends in a similar place, with MJ and Peter's best friend forgetting that he is Spider-Man. After asking Strange to exclude MJ from the spell, he then remembers Ned. Oh my god, Ned. Ned. What is a Ned? Yeah, Strange then pulls out a chunk of the magic to observe Ned closely, something he doesn't do for the others. Maybe an indicator that Ned has the hidden sorcerer abilities and Strange can now see it here. Now, when the Sanctum shakes and knocks over an artifact in the lobby, this is the same delicate, stupid thing that Thor knocks over in Ragnarok. Then Peter shouts, Basically everyone that knew that I was Spider-Man before should still know! And the moment Peter gives us our rule by which the multiverse men cross over, right before Strange sees the purple silhouette of the Lizard, the villain that Strange fights and has to catch off screen later, over Peter's shoulder is one of those other villains, a hulking figure. At first I thought Sandman, but based on the muscle definition, I think this is actually Venom, who also crossed over into the MCU only briefly during this event. And behind Lizard, you can start to see glowing dots for dozens more. Just a hint right here early in the movie that beyond these nearer crossovers are even more multiversal threats. Strange says, you changed my spell six times. Five times. They disagree, but Peter asks Strange to exclude MJ and Ned and May and Happy and then everyone who knew before. That's five. So Strange actually might have secretly adjusted the spell a sixth time to exclude himself and Wong, because he loves Peter so much. Later, as Peter glides down to the bridge, I like how he used his wingsuit webbing again. It retracts here, but his heads up display reads Edith offline, since the DODC shut down the whole Edith network, which is also why the voice has changed now. Now, when he retracts his armor, his suit underneath is wrinkled. I just love that little detail reflecting how it was crammed up against his body. Actually, later in this day, you can see how his blue button-up is also super wrinkled. Another cool detail, I like how the VFX artist adjusted his shadow on the side of the car just to match his silhouette changing. Peter passes a car with the license plate S-E-Y-S-I-D-P, and as we were clued in by the Enneagram book we saw in Peter's bedroom earlier, if you rearrange these, you get the word Spideys, plural, a clue for the multiple Spideys in this movie. The MIT woman's car has a tag 60 A5M3, a nod to the amazing Spider-Man number three in 1963, the comic debut of Doc Ock, who makes his MCU debut in this scene. Footage that the girl in the car watches on her tablet is actually a delayed live feed from the Daily Bugle helicopter. You can see Peter waving at the camera on the tablet, just as he did a minute before. Peter also passes a taxi numbered 1228, a nod to Stan Lee's birthday of December 28th, 1922. After Peter's rambling speech, the MIT woman responds, you didn't rehearse that, did you, Peter? Yeah, it is this failure that later leads Peter to script out and rehearse what he wants to say to MJ in the final scene. Doc Ock is revealed. Hello, Peter. Now the music sampled here is Danny Elfman's Doc Ock theme from 2004. You see how his claws glow red. This is how that film indicated when the claws were in control. And he asks, What have you done with my machine? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what machine. The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. Calling back his line from that film. The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. 
When Doc Ock lifts the concrete cylinder over him, I love how John Watts briefly frames him directly down the barrel of that cylinder. Really cool shot composition there. And I like how Peter gradually learns to combat Doc Ock as the fight progresses. Like he webs down one of his claws, and then right after, he webs a second claw to the car door to try to slow him down. Now, really cool detail here. As Peter suspends the SUV over the tracks, in a wide shot of that bridge, you can see the name Andrew graffitied on the bridge column. I'm pretty sure Toby and Andrew's names appear everywhere in this movie, folks. But then in a brief shot back on the bridge, another cool detail no one else I think has spotted, a license plate reads 6306 ASM for The Amazing Spider-Man number six in 1963. That was the debut of Kirk Connors the Lizard, whom Doctor Strange is dealing with at this moment in the sewers. Now you can see there's a lot to talk about when breaking down this amazing film. So to fuel me through this process, I've been trying my best to focus on some interesting choices in my snacking game. And you can take your snacking on an international adventure with our friends at Boxu. Boxu is a monthly subscription service that delivers premium Japanese snacks and tea pairings straight from Japan to your door. Boxu partners with family owned snack makers to make their original treats. Every monthly box is themed. This month's theme is Sakura season. Sakura is Japanese for cherry blossom and the cherry blossom is an important cultural symbol in Japan and their blooming is a huge event. So every year people celebrate by gathering under the trees for flower viewings called Hanami and they have picnics together. It's wonderful. As you can see, the box is just packed with all sorts of limited edition cherry blossom themed snacks. And this booklet that comes with it tells you everything that's in the box, what part of Japan it came from. So this is a Sakura mochi from Nagano in Japan. I just love the texture of mochi. I love how squishy it is. Oh, that's really good. Oh, I love mochi so much. It's like I am eating a pillow that's hugging my teeth back. Mm -mm -mm. So if you want to have your own Sakura celebration and support new rock stars here, click the link in the description and use the code ROCKSTARS to get $15 off your order. Doc Ock absorbs Peter's nanotech, something that he's able to do thanks to Oscorp's nanotechnology. I'm something of a scientist myself. I read all your research on nanotechnology, really brilliant. I'd like to thank Harry Osborne and Oscorp Industries for providing it. And when Doc Ock tries to stab him, Peter's nanotech shifts from his helmet to his chest and they mixed in a little ping sound effect so we know Doc Ock didn't stab him, just skewered his necktie. Peter's able to pair his OS with Doc Ock's arms since Doc Ock's arms are controlled via neural link. These smart arms are controlled by my brain through a neural link. Nano wires feed directly into my cerebellum. And Otto snaps at his claws. You don't listen to him, you listen to me. A call back to the 2004 movie. Listen to me now. Now, in the Undercroft, there are actually a total of six cells, eventually filled by the five multiverse men of this movie, plus one more that is filled by the tree that Peter accidentally catches. Six means that Strange anticipated catching Venom as well. And you can see how Strange's face is scratched now since he had just fought the lizard. Doc Og asks, What is this, a birthday party? Calling back Tony Stark referencing Strange's Jimmy Kimmel bit when they first met. What is your job exactly besides making balloon animals? Around the thawing sanctum, you can see various pages from spell books have been pinned up on lamps to dry out. Never a good idea to rip out pages from spell books, folks. Downstairs is a creepy doll that turns to look at them. On MJ's TikTok is a cosplayer dressed as a green elf looking just like Tom Holland's character in Pixar's Onward. And MJ also finds Doctor Strange's goatee trimming guard. Peter tracks down Electro and Sandman, Sandman helping Peter because they were on on good terms at the end of the 2007 film. Now one shot shows Peter pulling together multiple strands to beat Electro, mirrored from a shot of Andrew Garfield doing this to beat Electro in the 2014 film. Now when Electro and Sandman get trapped in the cells, in the foreground you can see the control panel showing five lit up icons for each cell. The fifth one lit up for the tree. There is a sixth unlit button for the cell that will soon be occupied by Norman. I'm telling you, one of these cells was going to be for Venom. Norman Osborn shatters his goblin mask. The framing in the alley matches the framing of Toby Peter leaving his suit behind in the 2004 film, but in both cases, those characters get dragged back into the game. But it is interesting to note that Goblin goes straight for Aunt May, because assuming he was transported from the Raimi-verse right after learning Peter was Spider-Man at Thanksgiving, sometime around that scene when he similarly cowered in front of the mask in his home, his next move there was to go for the heart, which in that movie was also Aunt May. The feast billboard tagged with Mysterio was right actually is a word bubble that says meet Queen's only Spider-Man. Inside, Norman wears a green coat and purple sweats, his colors in the comics, but also this is stuff he clearly got from the donation bin, meaning that he walked into this facility wearing his goblin suit, but Aunt May still wanted to help him. He says, Someone's living in my house. 
Oscorp doesn't exist. Yes, Oscorp does not exist in the MCU, making it likelier that Peter's spider bite might have come from Stark Tech. I made a whole video about that, check it out. Aunt May, meanwhile, is wearing a blue jumpsuit with a red sash. Throughout this movie, she's almost always wearing Spider-Man's red and blue colors. Goblin steals donuts in the background, signaling he's still in his shifty goblin survival mode, actually. And Peter says, This isn't my problem. Peter, not your problem. Calling back Toby's line in the 2002 film that led to Uncle Ben's death. I missed the part where that's my problem. J. Jonah Jameson's Chiron reads, Why does Spider-Man hate national landmarks? Showing the Washington Monument and the Tower Bridge. Now, if you look closely, you can see that feast truck actually used to be for the Forest Hills Moving Company. Forest Hills, Queens, is historically Peter Parker's neighborhood. Strange shows them the Machina di Cadavis. It's name coming from the crystal of Cadavis in the comics used to try to resurrect the dead in a Strange and Spider-Man team-up issue. In this case, it will doom these men to their deaths to make them literal cadavers. Strange pushes Peter's soul out of his body, but Peter's able to use his spider sense to control his limbs. Wavy lines stretch out from his head, which is how his spider sense looks in the comics and in animation. I also love the detail that his astral soul's shoes are untied, just showing Peter's inner hot mess nature. Strange throws a cloak of levitation around Peter, giving us the caped Spider-Man that we saw in the What If comics and in episode five of What If. Now on the newsstand is a People Magazine interview with Liz Allen from Homecoming. He's a liar, which I assume is a defense piece for her father Father Adrian Toome since Peter got him arrested. Something maybe we could revisit Morbius. But I like how the subhead reads Liz Allen's intimate past with Parker. Despite these two never actually kissed in Homecoming, it was in the trailer, but not in the final cut of the movie. So really this whole article is a distortion. In the mirror dimension, Peter tumbles down the high line of Manhattan and he passes a billboard showing a T-Rex skeleton. Just an interesting parallel to Strange's coming multiverse tumble past an actual T-Rex. On the train, Doctor Strange's Eye of Agamotto briefly opens and illuminates, showing that this artifact still has has some power beyond being a mere time stone fanny pack, something else that we will see in Multiverse Madness. Peter uses the geometry of Archimedean spirals to string up Strange shortly after Strange mentioned the grand calculus of the multiverse, geometry versus calculus, just showing how Peter used the simpler math to defeat his overthinking rival. Ow. Norman says the line, you know, I'm something of a scientist myself. Peter and Ned do their handshake from homecoming, but now Ned produces a spark out of that sling ring, cause he's a sorcerer. Peter takes them all into Happy's condo. Actually, a deleted scene would have shown them in the elevator together. Bummed we missed out on that. On the way in, we see them on the security monitor. Electro causes some distortion on the feed, and then he uses his hand to zap the TV on, where we see a news poll on that Statue of Liberty renovation showing 67% of New Yorkers disapprove of it. On the wall in Happy's back room is the name Slot, or Dan Slot, another big Spider-Man comics writer, that Stark Fabricator is the same kind of machine that Peter used to 3D print his new suit on the jet and far from home, and it is powered by the specific era of the arc reactor in Iron Man 2 when it had that triangular inlay. Tony Stark later replaced this with new versions, showing why these old ones would be stored. May and Doc Ock briefly connect in the kitchen, a nod to them getting married at one point in the comics. Yup, that happened. Sandman's holding up a framed photo of Morgan Stark, reminding him of his daughter Penny, who would be around the same age. Peter plugs in the new inhibitor chip to Doc Ock, the claw lights go from red to white as they did in the 2004 film to indicate auto regaining control. And notice on the fabricator, Peter created profiles for each of his patients, C. Connors, M. Dillon, N. Osborne, but only Max's cure is listed as complete, since as we see later when May tries to plug Norman with the antidote, it does not work. Otto chats with Norman. How does it feel, Norman? You're about to become whole again. No more darker half. Just you. Just me. Yes, Defoe uses his darker goblin voice there, teasing the goblin is about to make his move. Also notice, as he turns around, he is suddenly sweating bullets, despite not sweating that much seconds before this. And so, Peter's spider sense activates again. And like we saw on the bridge, we get another great dolly zoom camera move. Now behind him on the left here is actually Howard Stark's expo bottle from Iron Man 2, but the first person Peter passes in his trance is Norman, the source of the danger. The camera only pulls away from Peter when May enters the frame and she's burned Sage, and she says, what is it, Peter? So this whole sequence starts with Norman and it ends with May. Notice how Peter's left hand just slightly begins to raise to wed Norman, but only goes back down when Sandman asks what's happening, distracting Peter over on the right. And in that moment of distraction, Norman moves across the room to dummy, which even Doc Ock views as suspicious based off his expression. After Peter webs him, Goblin reveals himself. These are not curses, they're gifts. Gifts and curses, a callback to the 2002 film line. This is my gift, my curse. Also notice how Defoe now shows the gap in his teeth, which he did not have when he smiled before. Because in the 2002 film, Willem Defoe wore veneers as Norman Osborn, but shifted to his normal teeth when he transformed into Goblin. As Peter fights him, we see Happy also has a painting of Tony's Roadster hot rod. Tell you what, 
Throw a little hot rod red in there. Yes, that should help you keep a low profile. And Goblin smiles more and more as Peter punches him, showing how each hit makes him stronger and crazier. So Goblin hits May with his glider and bombs the place on his way out. He slices the Daily Bugle Van Telecom Tower, which actually does Jameson a favor because in his really shitty broadcast after this incident, he's able to lie and say that this was all Spider-Man's doing, not Goblin's. And then May drops the big adage. And with great power, there must also come great responsibility. They actually used the original version of this quote, there must also come from Amazing Fantasy 15 when Stan Lee spoke at his exposition. You can actually see this quote on Marissa Tomei's title card in the closing credits. And as she dies, Peter says, Okay, it's just me and you. Calling back when May said this to Peter in Homecoming. Just lay it out, it's just me and you which I read as May referring to Ben's recent death. It was just the two of them then and just the two of them now. Now in Ned's Nana's house, they also have that photo of Ned and MJ from Homecoming, showing how all three of these friends had a different copy of this. And we see it now because Ned and MJ really just wanna be with Peter. I think all this was intended to be a Back to the Future photo style prop to show how these two did have a version of their life without Peter in it. Now Lola also has a sewing machine, but just to be clear, this is a different sewing machine than the one Peter has at the end of the film. Andrew Garfield Spider-Man enters the film String theory, multidimensional reality, and matter displacement. All real? Yeah. Duh. Yeah, the little piano notes under there is actually James Horner's Amazing Spider-Man theme. I just love the meta wordplay between Andrew and MJ. Why do I need to crawl around? Because this is not enough. This is plenty. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. It is. No. Yeah, as if one past Spider-Man is not enough, which MJ doubles down on. Yeah, I, I guess you just keep doing it until we find the real one. Ouch. Now, when Andrew hops down from the ceiling, the sling ring portal has now pivoted to face him, turning on its axis from the direction it was facing before, just showing how Ned opened this portal in order to find Peter. And so Peter is how the portal orients itself in the room. Then Tobey Maguire enters. Great, it's just some random guy. Hello? Yes, the music is Danny Elfman's Spider-Man theme. And after teaching Peter some critical lessons about dealing with his grief, the three Peters rally to engineer some cures. Okay, so, uh, Connors, Marco, Dylan, and, um... Yes, he cannot bring himself to say Osborne's name because deep down he doesn't want to cure him yet, which Toby double checks. I think I can make an anti-serum for Dr. Osborne. Been thinking about it a long time. Gotta cure all of them, right? I also like the implication that Toby has been losing sleep over wishing he could have cured Osborne over all these years instead of watching him die. And when Toby talks about Harry Osborne, watch Andrew here. Do you have a best friend too? I did. You did? He died in my arms after he tried to kill me. Andrew goes from pity for Toby's friend dying in his arms to surprise and empathy for his Harry also trying to kill him. And we get the meme. Peter. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Did you mean, did you mean? Yeah, they all point at each other, which even the movie's script directs as memes. When Toby webs the stool, notice he still has his scars on his wrist from the Raimi films. And again, Andrew's reaction is the best. You can't do that, huh? No. How on earth does that even? Anyway, we're getting sidetracked. Look, this is where we're gonna do yeah, this. Yeah, it takes him a solid beat for Andrew to finally take his eyes off that scar. Andrew cracks Toby's back, less deadly than when he did it to Gwen. They reference fighting Venom in Spider-Man 3, and Thanos, and Rhino in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and Toby says, But it's just the like, self-talk maybe we should, you yeah, know. Yeah, listen. Because uh, you're, you're amazing. Just to take it in for a minute. Yeah, 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 I can you, take it in. No, I can take you it in. are amazing. Then Electro appears, and the bolts form the shape of Electro's classic mask from the comics on his face. You actually see this shape again later when he's zapping Andrew. Ned is unable to close his portal, and that might be because the other two times he opened the portal, the purpose he was seeking to find Peter was met, so those portals closed on their own. But now, Ned's real purpose deep down is to help this battle. He can't take his mind off the battle and allow that portal to close. At first, the three Peters fail to work together. Andrew swings through Tom's webbing and then tries to web the machinery, but webs Toby in the face. Sorry! Gross. Yeah, Toby says gross, despite Andrew's webbing being artificial, unlike his webbing that comes out of his body. Tom says, I was in the Avengers. The Avengers? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. What is that? Wait, you don't have the Avengers? Is that a band? Are you in a band? Calling back how Bruce compared the Avengers to the Beatles in Infinity War. Broke up. Like a band? Like, like the Beatles? And then when they leap, each Peter's jump is unique to his respective era. Toby does a double front flip, Tom does a frog pose, and Andrew does a clean nosedive. And then as they swim 
fling around, Toby does an under the legs whip as he would do in his movies, and then Tom turns around to web his two brothers to sling them along with him. And when he does this, he uses the side roll move that Cap did when he was fighting Peter in Civil War, fighting but actually helping him. And then at the end of the sequence, they land in the order of their eras. Toby first, Andrew second, Tom third. Now during the battle, Andrew webs up the lizard to restrain him, but it takes a while for the lizard to break out of it compared to the 2012 movie when Lizard was able to tear out of the webbing seconds later. Might be showing how Andrew spent these years strengthening his webbing after, you know. There you go. Lizard attacks MJ and Ned in the classroom, recalling his fight with Andrew in the high school in the 2012 film. Doc Ock is able to restrain Electro since his claws were designed to be impervious to energy spikes. And then after notice how Toby is holding his chest because unlike Andrew, his suit was not designed to be shockproof. Ned finally brings Doctor Strange back. I've been dangling over the Grand Canyon for 12 I know, hours. I know. In a way, this is a bit of payback for Strange making Loki free fall for a half hour in Ragnarok. I have been falling for 30 minutes. Goblin shouts. Can the Spider-Man come out to play? Calling back his line in the 2002 film. Can Spider-Man? come out to play. Now when Strange lassos the box and pulls it away, you can see Goblin with both hands on the box smiling because he just slipped in that pumpkin bomb. He cuts one of Doc Ock's arms and leaves them with... The explosion calls MJ to fall from the scaffolding, framing her just like Gwen's death drop. Except here, turned on the side, and Andrew retakes the plunge. Except this time, he focuses more on the leap instead of on his webbing. He catches her in his arms instead of clutching her with the web to avoid that whiplash. You know, that one. As Peter fights Norman on that shield, he leaps up at one point and punches down, denting the metal, which totally would have caved in his skull. He picks up the glider to stab him with it, the same way Goblin died in the 2002 film, but also evoking Cap, bringing down the shield on Tony in Civil War. A parallel that's even more obvious since they are fighting upon Cap's shield. But Toby stops Tom from killing Goblin. No words, just doesn't want the kid to grow rageful and bitter. But Goblin stabs him, and Tom literally turns his body from one side to the other. He was in killing mode, but now now he turns the cheek. Andrew sees this and assists him with the serum. Hey, nice catch. Nice throw. Toby's okay, saying, Yeah, I'm good. I've been stabbed before. Oh, God. Referring to when Harry Osborn stabbed him in the Raimi films. Purple cracks in the sky open up. I've broken this down before, but the visible silhouettes include Madam Web getting her own movie, the superior Spider Man armor with multiple arms, Craven the Hunter getting his own movie, Scorpion, the original comics form, Black Cat, and then later, Rhino. And then I figure everyone keeps calling Mysterio based off of the head, but I don't think so. This guy walks with more of a timid step and has a slender build. I think this is actually. Miles Morales. Peter tells Strange to go through with the spell, and they say goodbye to each other. Thank you, sir. Call me Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, still feels weird. Calling back their banter, of course, earlier in this movie, but also the very first time they met in Infinity War and joked about their real names. I'm Peter, by the way. Doctor Strange. Oh, you're using your made up names. Um, I'm Spider Man then. Peter hugs the other Peters. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. A hug that was improvised by Tom Holland to thank these past two eras of Spider Man. So after the spell goes through, Peter returns to the Peter Pan Donut Shop, a name with greater significance now for a Peter who has to watch others through a window living their lives without him. MJ attends to this older patron whom the script calls a Stan Lee lookalike. I suppose this was meant to be the film's Stan Lee cameo, but really just to make us do a a double take and evoke deja vu the way MJ feels in the scene. The script also states that MJ is meant to watch Peter go with, quote, a lingering sense of recognition. This, plus the fact that she is still wearing that broken Black Dahlia necklace, tells us that some part of her still remembers Peter. Aunt May's gravestone has the birth and death dates covered by flowers, which can be a nod to Tony Stark always questioning how young she really is back in Civil War. And the quote reads, when you help someone, you help everyone, which is actually what is written on her grave in the Spider-Man PS4 game. In the epilogue, Peter moves into a new apartment. Rent is due on the first of the month. 
Don't be late. Yes, his squalor apartment evokes Peter's crappy flat in the Raimi films. And while the landlord's voice is not Mr. Ditkovich, the fact that he reminds Peter of the rent is definitely meant to remind us of that guy. We see that Peter is studying for the GED, meaning Peter's academic records must have been wiped or warped, since if you think about it, much of his Midtown High identity was really wrapped up in his Spider-Man identity at this point. I did do another video breaking down how exactly reality was warped and who remembers what. I highly recommend you check it out. On Peter's table is the We Are Happy to Serve You cup that MJ gave Peter in the cafe. And by the way, that coffee cup is just a generic New York area coffee cup that appears in productions of literally everything shot in that city. It's not a reference to Hawkeye or to Daredevil. This cup is in everything. It's like saying a red solo cup is an Easter egg. But what is a cool detail, Peter has that Lego Palpatine figurine, which was the first line we heard spoken by Ned in this trilogy in Homecoming. And Peter has a new suit that he has stitched together, DIY, finally, without having Avengers to build his tech for him. And design-wise, it's made of a brighter fabric, clearly inspired by the designs of the other two Spider-Men. Actually, the closing credits show his sketches of a new logo as he swings through Rockefeller Center, failing to make a cameo in the final battle of Hawkeye. We get this awesome closing frame, almost a jump scare, because he zooms in right in on our faces, giving us an extreme close-up of his new mask. But up close like this, we can see it is textured in a porous fabric. Gone are those mechanical eyepieces. This is just a cloth mask, giving us a new beginning, a fresh start. Baby, that is everything I spotted in this high res digital release of No Way Home. But folks, there is still the 4K version coming next month. And there's gonna be a lot of deleted scenes, commentary, lots of bonus footage. There's gonna be a lot to talk about this film and we'll be revisiting again. So be sure to subscribe to New Rock Stars. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss. Check out our merch store, Epic Hero Shop, for lots of great designs to support this channel directly. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. <laughs>